Good morning, class. Um, since we're going to be staying at home for an extended period of time, I feel like it's time for us to use our internet resources, um, our online catalog for the South Middle School Library or something, or maybe you have a book at home, but we need to find a nonfiction book for us to read. Um, continuing further in this online template of class. Um, if we cannot find a nonfiction book that is viable for us to read, I will also begin reading another book um, to you starting at some point. I have a library here at home that I'm going to choose something from and we can start learning about nonfiction through one of my books. Um, but for the time being, today I want you to do your best to try to find an online nonfiction book that is appropriate for you to read and that is um, interesting to you in some way, shape, or form. If you have not already done so, we need to finish our Nucella articles, do the writing prompts and the quizzes on Nucella, and uh, access our Flipgrid so that we may uh, hear your responses to the books that we are reading online. Um, yeah, so the, the most important thing that I want you to think about today is finding a nonfiction book for you to read at home and accessing your Flipgrid class uh, code using your Microsoft email. I have it all set up. There, there should be no issues logging in. If there is, don't hesitate to contact me on Schoology. I should be able to help you in some way. Thank you. Um, today, I'm going to start reading Chapter 2 of Scythe and... Uh, again, chapter 2 of Scythe, you do not have to respond to this reading, but I would really appreciate your thoughts and predictions on the, on the novel by Neil Shusterman. Um, I think he does a really good job of world building. Uh, remember the last video, we introduced you to Citra and uh, Scythe Faraday. Um, that, that was a really interesting take there. Um, you heard a lot of things about, you know, how scythes work, why scythes exist. Um, we heard that uh, people are essentially immortal now. They don't ever die unless a scythe comes to kill them. Um, in Chapter 2, we're going to meet Rowan the second protagonist in the novel, and we're going to learn a little bit more about how Neil Shusterman's uh, world in the side them operates. Um, it's going to go into more detail about how people turn corners, or um, maybe they just, maybe more about how people have become able to not die or age. Uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to go ahead and start reading. Uh, Scythed, uh, beginning with a journal entry from the ending of chapter one. Here we go. It is the most difficult thing a person can be asked to do, and knowing that is that it is for the greater good doesn't make it any easier. People used to die naturally, Old age used to be a terminal affliction, not a temporary state. There were invisible killers called diseases that broke the body down. Aging could not be reversed. And there were accidents from which there were no return. Planes fell from the sky. Cars actually crashed. There was pain, misery, despair. It's hard for most of us to imagine a world so unsafe with dangers lurking in every unseen, unplanned corner of the earth. All of that is behind us now, and yet a simple truth remains. P. 
people must die. It's not as if we can go somewhere else. The disasters on the moon and Mars colonies proved that. We have one very limited world, and although death has been defeated as completely as polio, people still must die. The ending of human life used to be in the hands of nature, but we stole it. Now we have a monopoly on death. We are its sole distributor. I understand why there are sides and how important and how necessary the work is, but I often wonder why I had to be chosen. And if there is some eternal world after this one, what awaits the taker of lives? From the Gleaning Journal of H.S. Curie. Chapter 2. Point three zero three percent Tiger Salazar had hurled himself out of a 31-story window, leaving a terrible mess on the marble plaza below. His own parents were so annoyed by it, they didn't come to see him. But Rowan did. Rowan Damish was, the, was just the kind of friend to come and visit every time. He sat by Tiger's bedside at the Revival Center, waiting for him to wake from a speed healing. Rowan didn't mind. The Revival Center was quiet, peaceful, it was a nice break from the turmoil of his home, which lately had been filled with more relatives than any human being should be expected to endure. Cousins, second cousins, siblings, half-siblings, and now his grandmother had returned home after turning the corner for a third time. With a new husband and a baby on the way. You're going to have a new aunt, Rowan, she announced. Isn't it wonderful? The whole thing pissed Rowan's mother off, because this time, Grandma had reset all the way down to 25, making her 10 years younger than her daughter. Now Mom felt pressured to turn the corner herself, if only to keep up with Grandma. Grandpa was much more sensible. He was off in Euroscandia, charming the ladies and maintaining his age at a respectable 38. Rowan, at 16, had resolved he would experience gray hair before he turned his first corner. And even then, he wouldn't reset so far down as to be embarrassing. Some people reset to 21, which was the youngest genetic therapy could make a person. Rumor was, though, that they were working on ways to reset all the way down into the teens, which Rowan found ridiculous. Why would anyone in their right mind want to be a teenager more than once? When he glanced back at his friend, Tiger's eyes were open and studying Rowan. Hey, Rowan said. How long? Tiger asked. Four days. Tiger pumped his fist in triumph. Yes! A new record! He looked at his hands as if taking stock of the damage. There was, of course, no damage left. One did not wake up from speed healing until there was nothing left to heal. Do you think it was jumping from such a high floor that did it? Or was it the marble plaza? Probably the marble, Rowan said. Once you reach terminal velocity, it doesn't matter how high you are when you jump. Probably the marble. Did I crack it? Did they replace the marble? I don't know, Tiger. Jeez, enough already. Tiger leaned back into his pillow, immensely pleased with himself. Best splat ever. Rowan found he had the patience to wait for his friend to wake up, but no patience for him now that he was conscious. Why do you even do it? I mean, it's such a waste of time. Tiger shrugged. I like the way it feels on the way down. Besides, I gotta remind my parents that the lettuce is here. That made Rowan chuckle. It was Rowan who had coined the term lettuce kid to describe them. Both of them were born sandwiched somewhere in the middle of large families and were far from being their parents' favorites. I got a couple of brothers that are the meat, a few sisters that are the cheese and tomatoes, so I guess I'm the lettuce. The idea caught on and Rowan started a club at the, a club called the Iceberg Heads at school, which now bragged almost two dozen members. Although Tiger often teased that he was going to go rogue and start a Remain Revolt, Tiger had started splatting a few months ago. Rowan tried it once and found it to be a monumental pain. He ended up behind on, his, on all his schoolwork, and his parents levied forms of punishment which they promptly forgot to enforce. One of the perks of being the lettuce. 
Still, the thrill of the drop wasn't worth the cost. Tiger, on the other hand, had become a splatting junkie. You gotta find a new hobby, man, Rowan told him. I know the first revival is free, but the rest must be costing your parents a fortune. Yeah, and for once they have to spend their money on me. Wouldn't you rather they buy you a car? Revival is compulsory, Tiger said. A car is optional. If they're not forced to spend it, they won't. Rowan couldn't argue with that. He didn't have a car either, and doubted his parents would ever get him one. The public cars were clean, efficient, and drove themselves. His parents had argued. What would be the point in spending good money on something he didn't need? Meanwhile, they threw money in every direction but his. We're roguage, Tiger said. If we don't cause a little intestinal distress, no one knows we're there. The following morning, Rowan came to face came face to face with a scythe. It wasn't unheard of to see a scythe in his neighborhood. You couldn't help but run into one once in a while, but they didn't often show up in a high school. The encounter was Rowan's fault. Punctuality was not his strong point especially now that he was expected to escort his younger siblings and half-siblings to their school before hopping into a public car and hurrying to his. He had just arrived and was heading to the attendance window when the scythe came around the corner, his spotless ivory robe flaring behind him. Once, when hiking with his family, Rowan had gone off on his own and encountered a mountain lion. The tight feeling in his chest now as well as a weak feeling in his loins, had been exactly the same. Fight or flight, his biology said, but Rowan had done neither. Back then, he had fought those instincts and calmly raised his arms as he read to do, making himself look larger. It had worked, and the animal bounded away, saving him a trip to the local revival center. Now... The sudden prospect of a scythe before him, Rowan had an odd urge to do the same, as if raising his hands above his head could frighten the scythe away. The thought made him involuntarily laugh aloud. The last thing you want to do is laugh at a scythe. Could you direct me to the main office? The man asked. Rowan considered giving him directions and heading the opposite way, but decided that that was too cowardly. I'm going there, Rowan said. I'll take you. The man would appreciate his helpfulness, and getting on the good side of a scythe couldn't hurt. Rowan led the way, passing the other kids in the hall. Students who, like him, were late, or were just on an errand. They all gawked and tried to disappear into the wall as he and the scythe passed. Somehow, walking through the hall with a scythe became less frightening when there were others to bear the fear instead. And Rowan couldn't deny that it was a bit heady to be cast as the side's trailblazer. Riding in the cone of such respect, it wasn't until they reached the office that the truth hit home. The scythe was going to glean one of her own classmates today. Everyone in the office stood the moment they saw the scythe, and he wasted no time. Please have Cole Whitlock called to the office immediately. Cole Whitlock, said the secretary. The side didn't repeat himself because he knew she had heard. She just wasn't willing to believe. Yes, Your Honor, I'll do it right away. Rowan knew Cole. Hell, everyone knew Cole Whitlock, just a junior. He had already risen to the school's quarter to be the school's quarterback. He was going to take them all the way to the league championship for the first time in forever. The secretary's voice shook powerfully when she made the call into the intercom. She coughed as she said his name, choking up, and the scythe patiently waited Cole's arrival. The last thing Rowan wanted to do was antagonize a scythe. He should have just slunk off to the attendance window, gotten his readmit, and gone to class. But as with the mountain lion, he just had to stand his ground. It was a moment that would change his life. You're gleaning our star quarter pack? I hope you know that. The size demeanor, so cordial a moment before, took a turn toward Tombstone. I can't see how it's any of your business. You're in my school, Rowan said. I guess that makes it my business. Then self-preservation kicked in and he strode it to the attendance window just out of the size line of, light, line of sight. He handed his forged tardy note, all the while muttering, stoop, stoop, stoop. 
under his breath. He was lucky he wasn't born in a time when death was natural because he'd probably never survived to adulthood. As he turned to leave the office, he saw a bleak-eyed Cole Whitlock being led into the principal's office by the scythe. The principal voluntarily ejected himself from his own office, then locked, looked to the staff for an explanation, but only received the teary-eyed shaking of their heads. No one seemed to notice Rowan still lingering there. Who cared about the lettuce when the beef was being devoured? He slipped past the principal, who saw him just in time to put a hand to on his shoulder. Son, you don't want to go in there. He was right. Rowan didn't want to go in there, but he went anyway, closing the door behind him. There were two chairs in front of the principal's well-organized desk. The side sat in one, Cole in the other, hunched and sobbing. The side burned Rowan a glare. The mountain lion, thought Rowan. Only this one actually had the power to end a human life. His parents aren't here, Rowan said. He should have someone with him. Are you family? Does it matter? Then Cole raised his head. Please, God, don't make Ronald go, he pleaded. It's Rowan. Cole's expression shot to hor higher horror as if this error somehow sealed the deal. I knew that. I did. I really did. For all his bulk and bravado, Cole Whitlock was just a scared little kid. Is that what everyone became in the end, Rowan supposed? Only a scythe could know. Rather than forcing Rowan to leave, the scythe said, Grab a chair, then. Make yourself comfortable. As Rowan went around to pull, the prin pull out the principal's desk chair, he wondered if a scythe was being ironic or sarcastic, or if he didn't even know that making oneself comfortable was impossible in his presence. You can't do this to me, Cole begged. My parents will die. They'll just die. No, they won't, the scythe corrected. They'll live on. Can you at least give them a few minutes to prepare, Rowan asked. Are you telling me how to do my job? I'm asking for some mercy.